When we think about nutrients that impact our health, potassium probably isn't the first one that comes to mind. But what if I told you 97.8% of Americans aren't getting enough? And that this single mineral plays a role in everything from blood pressure regulation to bone strength, kidney health, and even your risk of stroke. In this video, we're gonna break down why potassium is essential, how much we actually need, and the best food sources so you can get more of this essential mineral. Hit me, producer pots. Dr. Sarah, you often quote an alarming statistic that 97.8% of Americans are not getting enough dietary potassium. And I know from looking at the article about potassium on Nutrivor.com that one of the biggest problems from not enough potassium is high blood pressure. But this made me think that potassium would be an awesome nutrient for us to do a deep dive on for a video because it's so much more than just that. And I feel like most people don't know about it. I love this idea. So let's dive deep into all of the ways getting enough potassium improves our long-term health. You might be familiar with potassium as an electrolyte. That means it carries an electrical charge, so it has biological roles in things such as fluid balance, nerve signaling, and muscle contractions. And it's through these biological rules that potassium is particularly important for regulating our blood pressure, reducing our risk of stroke, lowering our risk of kidney stones, and lowering our risk of osteoporosis. When it comes to regulating blood pressure, you can kind of think of potassium as the opposite of sodium. Sodium increases blood pressure and potassium decreases it. And in fact, these two minerals, these two ions work in opposition to each other. Potassium is the main positively charged ion within cells, whereas sodium is the main positively charged ion outside of cells. And the concentration difference between these two minerals creates something called the membrane potential, a gradient with electrical charge that ultimately controls the flow of ions across the cell membrane, which is important for a variety of biological processes, including blood pressure. And what we see from a wide variety of clinical trials is that even without changing sodium intake, just upping potassium can lower blood pressure. For example, a 2015 meta-analysis showed that people with hypertension, high blood pressure, when they took a potassium supplement in the range of 2,400 milligrams per day, that lowered their systolic blood pressure by an average of 6.8 millimeters of mercury and their diastolic blood pressure by an average of 4.6 millimeters of mercury, all without changing salt intake or sodium intake. And maybe not surprisingly, the effects were greatest among study participants who had low potassium intake to begin with. In fact, studies generally point to the ratio of sodium to potassium as being more important for regulating blood pressure than how much sodium we're consuming. So for example, some of the clinical trials looking at the DASH diet, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, found that reducing sodium did improve blood pressure in people consuming a typical Western diet, but didn't have much of an impact in people consuming higher potassium diets, where they're eating more vegetables, fruit, lean proteins, and whole grains. Now, high blood pressure is, of course, one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So it shouldn't be any surprise that getting enough dietary potassium also reduces risk of cardiovascular disease. But maybe what is interesting is that we see this most with our risk of stroke, with several meta-analyses showing anywhere between a 13 and a 30% risk reduction with dietary potassium intake at about 3,500 milligrams per day or more. And we still see the ratio of sodium to potassium as being important for stroke risk. Ideally, we would consume at least as much potassium as we are consuming sodium, so a one-to-one -one ratio. But observational studies show that for every one unit increase in the sodium to potassium ratio, our risk of stroke goes up by 22%. Potassium also seems to be really important for reducing risk of kidney stones, especially calcium oxalate kidney stones, the most common kind. In fact, studies that compare people with the most dietary potassium to the least dietary potassium show up to a 56% reduced risk of kidney stones. And our science on this goes way back, 
For example, there was a 1993 study that followed 45,000 men aged 40 to 75 with no prior history of kidney stones and showed that those with the highest potassium intake, which was over about 4,000 milligrams per day, had a 51% reduced risk of developing kidney stones over the four-year follow-up compared to the study participants with the least dietary potassium. More recently, a 2020 study from the Mayo Clinic followed about 400 individuals with symptomatic kidney stones and just shy of 400 controls, followed them for a decade. And consistent with previous studies, the researchers also found that study participants with the higher potassium diets had significantly lower risk of recurrent kidney stones, and that the effect was even greater in individuals who were not taking calcium supplements or diuretics. There's also evidence that potassium can help reduce the risk of developing osteoporosis. This seems to be especially true in women and older adults in general. For example, a 2015 cohort study showed that higher dietary potassium reduced markers that predict the risk of a future bone fracture in women, but not in men in this study. And a 2015 study of older adults found that those with the highest dietary potassium had significantly denser bones in several regions of the hip. It's worth noting that not all studies have shown a benefit of potassium to bone mineral density, so more studies are definitely needed to uh, confirm these findings. Another area of emerging research is the relationship between potassium and diabetic retinopathy. A 2022 cross-sectional retrospective study, after adjusting for a bunch of confounding factors, found that the only two micronutrients that were related to diabetic retinopathy risk were potassium and calcium. This type of study can't establish causality though, so again, more science needed. How much potassium do we need? So potassium does not actually have a recommended dietary intake level set. Instead, it has what's called an adequate intake level. Basically means that there's not enough science to be super certain about how much we need. So the adequate intake level for dietary potassium is 2,600 milligrams for adult women and 3,400 milligrams for adult men. And the daily value for potassium is set to 4,700 milligrams, in part because of the uncertainty about how much potassium we really need. And in part because there's so much research showing that higher potassium intakes are beneficial for our health, especially in the context of higher sodium diets. And of course, what might matter most is not exactly how much potassium we get, but how much potassium we get in relationship to how much sodium we consume. Scientists have actually estimated that prior to the agricultural revolution, potassium intake was something like seven times higher than sodium intake. Whereas in modern westernized diets, sodium intake is typically about three times higher than potassium. And this altered ratio we know for sure is relevant to our blood pressure as well as cardiovascular disease risk. What are the best food sources of potassium? Let's just look at common foods you're likely to be able to find at the grocery store and let's rank the top 12 best food sources of potassium, going by percent daily value of potassium per serving. Coming in at number 12 is tamarinds. A one cup serving of the pulp has 16% daily value of potassium. Number 11 is dried apricots. A half cup serving also has 16% daily value of potassium. And fun fact, the reason why fresh apricots are not on this list is simply because of how a serving is defined for the fresh fruit versus the dried fruit. Number 10 is coconut cream. One cup has 17% daily value of potassium. Number nine is edamame. A half cup serving has 17% daily value of potassium. Number eight is molasses. A serving is just one tablespoon, and that one tablespoon of molasses also has 17% daily value of potassium. Number seven is cassava, also called yucca or manioc. One cup measured raw also has 17% daily value of potassium. Number six is purple passion fruit. A one cup serving, 17% daily value of potassium. Number five is sun-dried tomatoes. A serving is half a cup and that delivers 20% daily value of potassium. Kind of the same deal as dried apricots. The reason why sun-dried tomatoes are on this list and fresh tomatoes are not is how a serving is technically defined. And number four is kind of the same deal again because it's raisins. 
A half cup serving has 23% daily value of potassium. Number three is yam, and we mean real yam, not sweet potatoes that are sometimes labeled as yams in the grocery store. A serving is one cup cubed measured raw, and that has 26% daily value of potassium. Number two is pigeon peas, also called red gram. A serving is a half cup cooked, and that has 30% daily value of potassium. And the number one best common food source of potassium is mature soybeans. A half cup, it's about the same whether you measure them raw or cooked, has 36% daily value of potassium. And if you'd like to learn more about potassium, uh, problems from too much or too little, how much different demographics need, and all of the best food sources, not just the best 12, you can learn that for free on my website. Go to Nutrivore.com, tap on nutrients, tap on potassium. And you might also like my top 25 foods for every nutrient ebook, which lists the top 25 foods for every nutrient, but it's, it's a great way to focus those food choices if you find yourself consistently falling short of one or more essential nutrients.